my life flows on. The first man to paint a portrait of every bird in North America. It was also at Cambridge that I met Reverend Henslow. It is a delightful day here in Bishop Hill, Illinois, and I'm honored that you would come hear me, Charles Darwin. I understand that you'd like to hear a little bit about my book on the origin of species. Astounding to me that this book, published so many years ago, is still one of the most controversial books ever written. I also understand you'd like to hear about my voyage on the Her Majesty's ship, the Beagle. But before I begin, I must tell you I am here in large part because of a dear friend of mine uh, from Cambridge University. His name was Benjamin Dunn Walsh, a name you probably do not know, but you should. He was one of the first American entomologists to prove that evolution was at work here in the prairies of Illinois. He used to send me boxes of beetles uh, from the prairie state and was part of the evidence that I used in discerning my theory. But um, where should I begin? With questions, of course, where all good science begins. Did creation happen just once? Or is a story of creation forever and always unfolding? Consider all of the creatures who live upon the earth today. Have they all been here since the dawn of time? Or, if you believe as I do, how is it that new creatures arise from the old? Why is it that some creatures have become extinct and others continue to thrive? What are the mechanisms that create new species? What are the laws that govern the natural world? These are the questions I spent a lifetime trying to answer, and I shall answer for you as well as one can in the time allotted to me today. <laughs> My studies began at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. I hoped to follow in my father's footsteps and my grandfather. They were both physicians. My grandfather was actually invited to be the head physician for the King of England. Would you take the job? He politely declined, preferring a simple rural practice. Now, at Edinburgh, I remember watching a surgeon at work without anesthesia. As they slice this boy open, oh, the blood-curdling screams sent me fleeing from the observatory, and I vowed a physician I would never be. So my sisters, they arranged for me to transfer to Cambridge University. Now, my father at first was, was highly uh, upset. He said, you spend all of your time rat catching on your Uncle Josiah Wedgwood's estate. You'll amount to nothing. You'll be a disgrace to yourself and your family name. My father never spoke so harshly to his beloved children. The sting of those words are well felt, and they shall be long remembered. But again, it was my sisters who encouraged me to transfer to Cambridge to pursue a career in the clergy. Yes, as a clergyman, I only had to work on Sundays. And I could spend the rest of the week pursuing my passion, the natural sciences. It was at Cambridge that I met Benjamin Dunn Walsh, and we would collect insects together. I remember one day I was walking in the heath, and I saw a beetle I'd never seen before, and so I snatched it in one hand. In the same moment, I spied a second variety of beetle, so I snatched it in my other hand. And crawling out from under the bark of a stump, I saw a third variety of beetle. Three beetles, two hands, what would you do? I popped one in my mouth for safekeeping. Now, if you had such a beetle in your mouth, what would you do? <laughs> exactly what the beetle wants you to do. I spat it from my mouth, and the third one also escaped. But how could it be there were three varieties of beetle in this one place? Each of them adapted to a different food supply. One had small pinchers for eating leaves and herbivore. Another had large pinchers for eating other insects, a carnivore. And a third had a, a proboscis, uh, like a straw for sucking sap, a parasite. Each of them had adapted to a different food supply. But all three were clearly insects with a hard, shiny exoskeleton and six legs. What had they inherited from their ancestors? 
What in nature had selected them, allowing them over time to adapt and these varieties to give rise to new species? These were the questions that haunted me, questions I spent a lifetime trying to answer. But no poet was ever as proud to see his first poem in print than I was to see one of my Beatles published in Stephen's Illustrated Beatles of Great Britain. And under the illustration was my name, collected by Charles Darwin. It was also at Cambridge that I met Reverend Henslow. Reverend Henslow was a professor of botany. He taught me more than the names of flowers, but actually uh, the parts of each plant. Can you name them? And what is the purpose of each part of each plant? Physiology, anatomy. But he also taught me to look at the plant within the broader habitat. The way some plants, like these epiphytes, are adapted to live in the uh, branches of trees. And how others uh, live in bog soil. And the cacti, an entirely different plant, is adapted to living in a dry desert environment. And how the environment influences the form and function of the flower and the leaves. Henslow <coughs> introduced me to Reverend Sedgwick. Sedgwick was a professor of geology. He invited me to go on a walking tour of Wales. Would you like to go? We spent what you would call our spring break walking through the countryside, collecting rocks. Every morning we left from the same inn, but we walked different parallel paths. We collected stones along the day, and we labeled each stone as to where it was found. And, and uh, then at the end of the day, we lined the stones up in the order with which we found them along the parallel paths. And we began to piece together the clues of the countryside. Now, I'm sure you've all heard that old cliche, if only stones could speak the stories they could tell. Well, they are talking. If you learn their language, it's called geology. And more than a collection of boulders and beetles and butterflies, I learned that science is a process of asking difficult questions, piecing together the clues and drawing your own conclusions, looking for the laws that govern the natural world. Little did I know that all of this was preparing me for the journey of a lifetime. I was originally told the journey would last for two years. The night before we left, I was told it might be three years or more. I sent a letter to my father, making sure the letter would arrive after we had set sail. And as you may know, for five years, we circumnavigated the globe. I could tell you hundreds of stories about my adventures, but in the time allotted to me, allow me to share just a few. I'll never forget the first time I arrived in the Amazonian rainforest of Brazil. The mind was a chaos of delight. Everywhere I looked, there were some new species, huge trees entangled with all manner of vines, flowers, epiphytes growing on the higher branches. One flower was the size of a dinner plate, and no, it seemed to flutter away. It was not a flower. It was a blue morpho butterfly. I eventually collected more than 10,000 specimens, more than 2,000 species that were new to science. And every ship that passed, I would give them crates and barrels of pickled fishes and dried skins and feathers and pressed plants. One of the discoveries that bore my name was Rhea Darwini, the Lesser Rhea. I spent much of my time on shore hunting with the gauchos, and they told me about this tall, flightless bird where we had captured some, hunting with a, uh, a bolos. Imagine riding a horse. And as you're riding along, you're whirling these stones above your head. And you're chasing your prey over difficult terrain. You release the stones. You hope that they entangle the legs of the beast. It falls to the ground. You pounce upon it, and you have your supper. The first time I tried, I'm a good horseman. Difficult terrain, not a problem. Whirling this new implement and chasing prey, when I went to release it, the stone ricocheted off a small shrub and entangled the legs of my horse, which tossed me to the ground. <laughs> the gauchos had a good laugh. They said, we have seen men capture all manner of beasts, but we've never seen a man capture himself. 
<laughs> well, noticing my curiosity for new species, they told me that this tall flightless bird had a relative that lived further to the south and it was smaller. We looked for weeks and we could not find one. It was actually a couple months later. I was back on board the ship. I remember it was the day after Christmas. We had been at sea for nearly a year. And this was to be our Christmas dinner. We had all manner of seafood that we caught in the nets that I trailed behind the boat. We also, uh, as our main course, like your roast turkey or roast goose, we had a roasted ria. It was smaller than the ria I'd eaten with the gauchos. But it wasn't until I'd picked the bones clean, I discovered a new species on my dinner plate. I went to my mates and I collected the bones from their plates. Lucky for me, the skin and entrails, which are usually tossed off the back of the ship to feed the sharks, they had not yet been thrown overboard. I had enough to piece together what was indeed a new species, the lesser Rhea, Rhea Darwini. But every discovery leads to more questions. How could it be that there were two varieties of Rhea living in the same grasslands? Were they distant relatives of the ostrich of Africa and the emu of South America? Or had all of them adapted to the same habitat, tall grasslands, so they had long necks to see over the grass and long legs for rapid flight across the ground? They had lost their wings and ability to fly. More questions I could not answer. A few weeks later, I was back on shore, and maybe I should tell you, the five years that we spent, more than three of those years, I was on the shore, collecting specimens. While the ship was measuring the depth of the harbor or the port, drawing maps for Her Majesty's ship, HMS Beagle, that was her mission. For those who have the best maps of the world, are better able to control that world and build an empire. So while she was measuring the ports, I was ashore. And I was hunting with the gauchos. We had a fine breakfast of armadillo. Have you ever eaten an armadillo? They're actually quite tasty and not hard to catch. The South American armadillo, when it is afraid, it curls up in a ball. So you simply kick it like a soccer ball onto the fire and roast it on the half shell. <laughs> One armadillo is a good breakfast for two hungry gauchos. Maybe I should also tell you, when you're traveling in the wilderness, you eat whatever is at hand. And my brother, he still teases me. I remember he once wrote in a letter, wherever Charles Darwin goes, he's followed by a wave of mass extinction on his dinner plate. <laughs> well, again, the gauchos, knowing my curiosity for new species, they told me of a friend of theirs who had an unusually large shell. I insisted they take me to see it. This shell of an ancient glyptodont, an ancient relative of the armadillo, was so large that any of you could wear it as armor as you go into battle. He used it to shelter a mother pig and her piglets. I asked him where did he find such a shell, and he took me to Rio del Negro, where the river enters the Atlantic Ocean, and there in the cliff, I found all manner of prehistoric beast the most complete skeleton of a glyptodont ever found, and Megalonyx jeffersoni. You recognize that last name? Thomas Jefferson was the first to describe the giant sloth bear. But more discoveries led to more questions. What had the modern armadillo inherited from its ancient ancestor besides the hard shell? What did the modern three-toed sloth inherited from the ancient sloth besides a propensity for eating the tender leaves at the tops of trees? Whereas the three-toed sloth will very slowly climb up, the giant sloth grabs a tree and bends it down to get at those leaves. What have you inherited from your ancestors? We sailed around the southern tip of South America, Tierra del Fuego, through a passage, it still bears our name, the passage of the Beagle. And the good captain, he named a mountain for me. Mount Darwin is still there as well. We arrived at the village of Concepcion, and it was astounding. The earth began to tremble and shake. The large cathedral built by the Spanish missionaries fell to a pile of rubble, and the hovels built by the peasants turned to dust. We were safely at sea as we watched the earth tremble. And in one quaking of the earth, the entire city was lay in ruins. 
As soon as the earth ceased its trembling, we rushed ashore. We dug to see what survivors we could rescue. We shared with them what little food and water we could spare. But as a scientist, what was most astounding to me is land that yesterday had been under the sea was raised seven feet above sea level. A coral reef became a landmass. And even more astounding, as I climbed high in the Andes Mountains at an elevation of about 7,000 feet above sea level, I found an ancient forest, much more than this small piece of petrified wood I brought as a sample, but logs, hundreds and hundreds of them. And more astounding still, at an elevation of 14,000 feet at the top of the Andes Mountains, I found seashells. Taking a page from the notebook of Reverend Adam Sedgwick, let me ask you, what stories do these stones tell? Go ahead, piece together the evidence. Clearly, if it takes one trembling of the earth to move a coral reef seven feet above sea level, and such an earthquake happens once in a millennia, how long does it take for a tree to fossilize, fall below sea level, grow a coral reef on top of it, and all of this to move 14,000 feet above sea level. Clearly, the Earth is so much older than uh, some scholars might have us believe with the literal translation of the Bible. It would take eons of time. And this time would be necessary for the changes in species of which I speak. A few short weeks later, we sailed to the now fabled Isles of the Galapagos. Have you been? Could you imagine? It was like watching the Earth give birth to a new landmass as volcanoes rise from the depths of the sea. And because of the cold currents coming from Antarctica and the warm currents coming from the equator and smaller currents bringing a raft of creatures from the mainland, it is like a few creatures began to populate each island, and then another, and another, and on each island, separated by enough ocean water, they had changed in different directions. Instead of the hundreds of species that you might see in the rainforest of Brazil, on the Galapagos Islands, there'd be a handful of species, like the daisy. You probably know it as a small herbaceous plant, they were daisies that were vines and small shrubs. And the Galapagos tortoise. Why, well, the governor told me, I can tell you what island the tortoise is from with my eyes closed. I didn't believe him until I saw or felt that some had dome shells and others had a little rise like a Spanish saddle where the stirrup would go. Those that had the rise, they stood on their hind legs and the tortoise would eat the creosote bush. And those with a perfect dome, they lived on an island that had more grass, so they could graze down below. Most amazing were the finches. On one island, we might have five or seven or a dozen species, maybe half of them endemic, found just on that island. And on another island, 20 miles away, there'd be another dozen species of finches. And maybe eight or 10 of those are endemic, found only on that island. Some had large pinches for eating seeds, like the American grosbeak or the cardinal. Some had narrow pinches for uh, collecting insects and insectivore. I even saw a finch that used a tool. We thought humans were the only ones to use tools. But I saw it break off a small twig, snap the twig on both ends until it was just the right length and diameter. And then like a spear, it would probe under the bark and it would spear lava of beetles like a shish kebab and eat them for dinner. As we sailed away from the Galapagos, I remember sketching in my journal the first forked flowering tree of life. And I wrote simply two words. I think, without the exclamation mark of surety or the question mark of doubt. And I knew with those two words, I was committing a murder. 
There were those who would accuse me of killing God. And so I kept a secret notebook for 30 years and shared it with virtually no one. We arrived back in England, and little did I know all those specimens I had shipped home had made me a celebrity in the scientific community. Every geologist wanted to study the stones. Every uh, botanist wanted to leaf through the plants. Every entomologist wanted to study the insects. I asked Richard Owens to help me with the fossil evidence. You may know this man. He coined the term dinosaur. Of course, Henslow helped me with the plants. I was elected secretary of the Royal Academy, and I was faced with a difficult choice. Do I live the life of a bon vivant with my inheritance, never would have to work a day of my life, or do I marry and settle down? I chose to marry. My wife and I, we purchased property just outside of London, and I dedicated my life to science. Even my children would help me with some of my experiments. I went to work on this secret idea of the transmutation of species. When I had gathered enough evidence, I wrote an outline of 20 or 30 pages and shared it with a few close friends. They scoffed and said, Darwin, this is your life work. The rest of this research, it's a distraction. Little did they know, the rest of this research was gathering evidence. I didn't want to be ridiculed like the French scientist Lamarck or my grandfather Erasmus, who published a book-long poem called Zoonomia on the theory of evolution. So the idea was not new. But they were scorned because they presented no evidence. One of my friends, he said, if you do not publish soon, someone will steal your precedence. It was prophecy. A young scientist, Alfred Russell Wallace, while in Malaysia, suffering from malaria, outlined his theory on the transmutation of species I frequently bought boxes of insects, especially butterflies, and with a shipment of insects he collected, he sent me his paper and he asked my opinion. If I thought it was worthy of publication, I was thunderstruck, for the titles of each section of his article perfectly paralleled the titles of the chapters of my yet unpublished book. I took my dilemma to my friends, and finer friends one could not ask for. They snatched the papers from my hand, and they said, it is out of your hands, quite literally. They said the only ethical thing to do is publish both in the same press and share precedence. And you, Charles Darwin, should not be present at the academy when the papers are delivered. The editor said, nothing of significance has been published in this year's magazine. Why even publish? Little did he know the firestorm that was about to erupt. I immediately went to work, and in less than a year, I outlined this book on the origin of species. Would you like to hear something of my theory? Actually, you already have, and the stories that I've told you. If you think about my point of view, Latin, vista, V-I-S-T-A, the story of the Rhea is a story of variation, The story of the armadillo, the glyptodont, is the story of inheritance. The story of the uh, Galapagos Islands is both the story of natural selection and adaptation. And the story of Concepcion is a story of time. Individual variation through inheritance and natural selection over eons of time allows adaptation to give rise to new species forward or backward. As individuals adapt to changes in their environment, that adaptation over eons of time through natural selection allows traits to be inherited and those offspring thrive and variation gives rise to new species. V-I-S-T-A. Variation, inheritance, natural selection, time, and adaptation. Now, there are some who argue, saying, believing in Darwin is denying the existence of God. What is the role of God in all of this? I say, you're asking different questions, so of course we're going to find different answers. Theology is about faith. The creation of the world, I will leave for theologian. I'm asking simple scientific questions with measurable outcomes 
about the origin of individual species. Maybe my good friend, Benjamin Dunn Walsh, he said it best when he once wrote in a letter, magna es veritas et veritas prevail a bit. Great is the truth and the truth shall prevail. I tell you, there's grandeur in this view of life. Consider an entangled stream bank, all manner of bushes and vines and flowers blooming. There are birds singing in the high branches and butterflies flitting about, earthworms crawling through the damp soil and the roots of the trees dig deep into the ancient fossil forms. To think that from one or maybe a few forms Power breathed into them as the earth has gone on cycling according to the fixed laws of gravity. Life has and continues to be evolved. <laughs>